Hello and welcome to Teta Ted France 24's flagship interview show. Our guest today is the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. Mr. President, thank you very much for being our guest. You're welcome. In a recent interview, uh, the president, Felix Tshisekedi, said, quote, what's happening in Eastern DRC is a genocide 10 times worse than the one in Rwanda in 1994. And he points the figure at you and say you deserve much more than the International Criminal Court. What is your response? Well, it's, it's, uh, you can't um, be responding to everything and everybody says, whether it is an exaggeration or fabrication or people running away from their own problems and blaming others, which this case seems to be. So, Using the word genocide is not by accident, probably, no? Well, I wouldn't come to that and, and just leave behind defining the problem, what actually, that actually is taking place. Eastern Congo problems should clearly be understood even by uh, the person who leads that country. He does seem to have a selective memory of what to call what is happening there, uh, because in Rwanda we have a hundred thousand refugees, a hundred thousand, and they keep coming. And most, some of them, or most of them, have been there for over twenty years, and they are associated with this problem. And these people, they've lost their property, their land, their, their own relatives and friends have been killed in Eastern Congo because of who they are. You might want to know that the mirror image of what happened in Rwanda in 94 has actually evolved over years in Eastern Congo. The ones, the 100,000 people I'm talking about, and actually there are three, four times, or four times, the same number in Uganda, and I think others have gone to other places. They've been uh, removed from their place, their property, and their lives, their, their lives have been destroyed because they are called Tutsis. So, uh, so the Tutsis of Congo are supposed to be treated like the Tutsis of uh, Rwanda in 94. And in fact, you see it when you look at the alliances that have even been formed, both on the ground in Eastern Congo and bringing in Burundi and the pronouncements made by the same person making accusations or, or publicly on, on the media platforms. Uh, with the head speech and the support for FDRR that killed the same uh, Rwandans uh, mm -hmm. in, in Rwanda. So the way they come together under this leadership in DRC, I mean, to, to ignore that and you, you want to call it something else somewhere else by somebody, uh, I think, you have to be missing something in, in, in your mind. Meaning he's not rational? Is that what you're implying? Uh, here I'm not even saying he himself. I'm talking about anybody who listens to that and thinks he's even being rational. Um, there is a mediation by Angola for months to try to bring your foreign ministers and eventually you and the president of DRC together uh, from uh, what we're hearing on both sides, it doesn't seem that this is going to work. Or are you still hoping? I don't know, but uh, for us, we have been very clear. Uh, there are processes in our region. There's the Luanda process in Angola. There has been Nairobi process in Kenya. There have been other efforts to try and help resolve the problem. But nothing's working, right? Yes, but for Rwanda, we have always been present 
and have contributed as much as we can to make it work. But uh, Congo seems to have other ideas because East African community deployed forces there to go and help. The next day he expelled them. Then he brings in other groups he selected who he believed were going to fight for him to be able to continue what he's been doing. He brought in uh, Sadak forces, then he detached Burundi from the East African forces and there are others. So we, we, the whole thing is confused, but it is being confused by the same people who are hearing and complaining about problems. You're still open to meeting him directly, despite all the misgivings you just talked about? I saw him as the one who put conditions. <laughs> I have never put conditions. When, we, when I was invited in Rwanda to have discussions on Eastern Congo and, and the RSC general situation there between them and Rwanda, I was there. Then there were uh, ministerial meetings that were supposed to prepare for when we should meet. I you can ask the Angolans, they will tell you. I was ready, I have always been ready. Are you still ready? Everybody. That's my question. Or do you think it's too late? You, the trust is lost. There has, I don't think the question matters a lot because it is just a repetition of what I'm saying uh, that you are making me do. I'm told you I've been always ready. So if I am saying that and I haven't, if I was not ready, I would tell you I'm not ready. But I haven't told you that. Um, in recent months, uh, the United Nations, but also the United States, France, the European Union have accused Rwanda not only of supporting the M23 uh, group, but of being directly military involved in the DRC. There's just a new uh, report from the uh, group of experts at the UN that says you're more and more present uh, in DRC, the Rwandan Armed Forces. Well, is this the case? Because you've never accepted this, but clearly we're seeing them accuse you much more directly than previously. Why would Rwanda be in Congo? That question needs to be asked, or, or, or is supporting M23 needs to be asked by anyone who wants to understand the problem and even later on deal with it. Because you have to understand what is M23? How did they come about? Rwanda did not create M23. They That's were created what the by international the international community is saying. Creating M23? Mm -hmm. No, they are saying. I don't think I have heard them say that we are the ones who created them. All they have said is that we are supporting them. And for me, the question is, we are supporting an entity that exists. Why? First of all, if it exists, why don't we look at the root cause of this problem? So the international community can also, I mean, it just because it is international community, you don't accept everything they say or they question. You just have to go by facts. And this is what we keep raising with them. How do they explain that we have refugees, 100,000 people persecuted in Eastern Congo because of their identity? And now they want to turn them into Rwandan citizens when they are Congolese? And, and everybody is talking about uh, these accusations? I understand what you're saying, but can you answer that question? Are Rwandan military forces present can in DRC answer, for whatever reason? Can you answer my question as well? I'm not obliged to answer your question if you are not ready to answer my question. And this is what I tell the Western countries and others who raise these matters out of context. So I, I cannot just, uh, you, so I, you want to turn everything, a very complicated situation and a big problem, into a narrow thing of just accusing Rwanda of presence in Eastern Congo. No, and this is what I'm refusing. Let's not just talk about presence or support of anybody. Let's also talk about the underlying causes that would even make anybody do what they have to do if that is the case. So let me try to phrase this differently. Do you feel that the situation in Eastern Congo is a direct threat to the security of Rwanda and thereby means that Rwanda will take any measures to defend itself, which could also mean military? We have said that publicly. Right. There is no secret about it. It's a threat in as far as 
Congo is running away from its problems of its citizens, whom it deprives of their, all their rights and kills them and persecutes them. And there is hate speech. There is actually genocidal ideology operating in Eastern Congo. And this can't be happening on its own. So there is that persecution of these people being called Tutsis, and therefore they must suffer like those in Rwanda in 1994 suffered. Then there is the support for FDRR. These are genocidal forces that have been in Congo for close, for now, 30 years, actually. Now, why, why, what is this international community asking? Or what raise They've questions also asked are they the raising? Congolese they are, government why? to take their distances and deal with the FDLR. What is that? I mean, do they have to beg them to do that? They are begging them. So in other words, they are telling Congo, Solve that problem if you want, but if you don't want, we are still with you. Is that the case? So for us, from that, the question you are asked, are they, is this a threat? Is that situation a threat to us? Absolutely. And shall we react to that in a manner we think fit to resolve that? No question about it. Is war with DRC a real possibility? Well, you referred to what President Sekedu was answering and or raising as questions. Among other things, I think he has told you and others several times, even recently, he was talking about taking war to Rwanda and removing the government and blah, 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 all kinds of things. Well, if somebody is saying that, and in this kind of situation, well, on one hand, you may think this person is bluffing, or he has nothing else to say other than that. But at the same time, given our own situation and experience and history, we don't take anything for granted. So you're ready to fight if need be? Whether this Eastern Congo situation and what comes out of flows over to our territory or anything else. We are ready to fight. Because we, we are there as a result of having fought for our own rights and existence. There's no question about it. So we are not shying away from saying, if anybody finds us uh, or threatens us, I, I mean, I don't, it's not a secret. We are are you afraid fight. of Western sanctions because of the presence denounced of your troops in let the me tell you. Let me tell you this with our history, with all these things we are talking about, the way we have been shaped by these hardships and injustices, and it doesn't matter by who, we are not afraid of anything. Elections are scheduled on July the 15th. Uh, you only have two opponents, uh, no real opposition. Obviously, uh, many observers believe that uh, this uh, will be obviously very easy uh, for you, too uh, easy, uh, because they said there's no real uh, opposition, no real democratic uh, life. Uh, why is Rwanda still uh, a democracy where you have very little opposition after all those years? Is it because of you? For the opposition, there are those that exist. Even if you call them few, that's fine. I don't know whether there is a number that one must Many have. Many were disqualified, you know that. I mean, and there, there is this notion that it's a controlled election, essentially, not a full-fledged election. Yeah, that's half the story. If, if they are controlled or whatever, do you understand the process? I think if you are interested in knowing what is happening in Rwanda, you have to understand the process. Mm -hmm. And our process is no different from other processes anywhere in the world. Right. But being elected with 90 or 95 percent, do you think it's a healthy thing for Rwanda? Because that's the most likely result. The situations and the contexts are different. I don't even mind that somebody is elected by 15 percent if that is their context. But why should you worry about somebody being elected with 90 percent if that is their context? Because in the end, it is the context that he decides. Uh, there were uh, some reports recently uh, conducted by 
a series of media organized called Rwanda Classified, uh, which report about the pattern of uh, repression uh, inside Rwanda, outside Rwanda against uh, those who oppose you. Um, we don't obviously have time to cover everything. Uh, I want to touch upon the, the case of an investigative uh, reporter, John Twali, who died in uh, January 23, officially from a motorbike accident, according to the reports. Where? Well, in, in Rwanda. In Rwanda, yes. Mm -hmm. According to the reports, uh, there's a suspicion that he was actually uh, eliminated uh, because of his work, his investigative work, because of his opposition. What do you make, this is an example of those reports who are essentially saying that you're behind a repression machine and sometimes a killing machine. What they are doing is not trying to be right and correct. and They haven't even investigated what you are talking about. But it shows where they come from. It's always an attitude. It's always uh, arrogance. It's always, when it comes, even like uh, we are sitting here, a, a journalist from these countries will feel happy, you know, throwing a mud at me and using me, literally insulting me. That, and in the end, they pass for being heroes. So you deny all those allegations? No, uh... answer my question because I'm not supposed to be here in front of you <laughs> answering allegations. You are not the judge. I'm not being prosecuted. Here we are talking about, we are reasoning. We are talking about uh, journalism. We are talking about politics. Mm. And we have to have facts and evidence for what you are talking about. Paul Kagame, I want to thank you very much uh, for being our guest uh, today. And thank you for watching this show here on Friends 24.